I titled this Anything and Everything, uh, the theme discourse, because that's really what our theme is, Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And I first, before I do uh, anything, I wanted to bring greetings to you from our family. Now, this is a picture from a few years ago at General Convention because we know that we haven't been able to take some new ones recently. But all of us, Rachel, Aaron, Gretchen, myself, all send uh, Christian love and greetings to all of you. And uh, may God continue to bless you in your efforts to serve him. Well, it certainly is a time for anxiety and worry. In uh, 2022, here's the uh, results of surveys that have been done in what worries the world. This is an Ipsos survey, and you can read it yourself if you go online. Uh, number one, the coronavirus, still hanging around 33% of the people say that that causes them the most worry, the most anxiety. Second on the list is poverty and social inequality, just behind at 31%. Uh, unemployment and jobs are 29%. And we have no uh, great unemployment here. We have people that don't want to take jobs, but that's still a worry. No surprise, financial political corruption causes people great anxiety. 27% of the people said that that's what worries them. Crime and violence, just close behind at 26%, and inflation here, especially at 23%. Anxiety usually comes because cognitively in our mind, we're trying to gain control over something that we don't have control over. You look at all these, how much of us have any kind of control over these personal issues? So what do people do? Well, they worry about them. They're trying to gain control by trying to see what the future might hold. And if I do that, if I can predict what will happen, then I'll be better prepared for it. Well, I think the problem is uh, we always tend to anticipate the worst thing that can happen. And that just creates more anxiety in our life. After all, one of the two big fears today are a meteor striking the planet or a zombie apocalypse. And that really doesn't, uh, any amount of preparation won't help people prepare for that very well. COVID-19 at the top of the list, it did cause a lot of anxiety and especially among kids. Uh, this was published May 22nd in Israel. Israel says they saw during the whole pandemic a rise in violence, depression, anxiety, especially among those youths. And according to a report published by a group there called the Elam Group, which is a nonprofit welfare group, they surveyed 2,126 teenagers who reported some kind of violent incidents outside their home. That's almost twice as much as what had happened in 2020. And when you look at before the pandemic, 2019 at 360%, almost four times as high as it was uh, before the pandemic. In Canada, where Vancouver uh, brethren reside, uh, 2021, we had a Canadian senator admits that he was taking a drug for depression. Uh, the statistics in Canada, one in four Canadian adults say they have symptoms of depression, anxiety, uh, PTSD, uh, that's an increase from one in five that was reported back in 2020. A group called StatScan that collects that information also found about 3 million Canadians that are over the age of 12 said their mental health uh, was fair or poor. More than 6 million said that their days were quite a bit or extremely stressful. Now, mental health struggles are certainly always there. And certainly Canadian adults before COVID-19 experienced them, but StatScan says there is certainly 
an emphasis now on pre-existing symptoms that may have intensified during the pandemic. In America, this is based on a survey from May 23rd, fewer Americans are anxious about COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, according to a Healthy Minds poll, but about half reported still having anxiety down from 65%, 75% respectively in the last two years. That was released by the American Psychiatric Association at their annual meeting last month. So we've gotten through the COVID-19 worst of the anxiety, but now what? 73% of Americans said now they are somewhat or extremely anxious about the state of the world. So it's, <laughs> It's almost as though we can't go anywhere else uh, without worrying about it. Now there's been talk of a great food crisis globally and it's been called apocalypse, an apocalypse. Interesting, isn't it? Apocalypse, and this is from the Guardian on May 21st, said apocalypse is an alarming idea, commonly taken to denote catastrophic destruction foreshadowing the end of the world. But in the original Greek, which we know, apocalypsis means a revelation, an uncovering. And in the vernacular means to take the lid off something. Well, we know revelation is a revealing of those things, but apocalypse has come to sound that. Last week, uh, well, a week before May 21st, Antonio Guterres, who is the UN Secretary General said, the shortages coming out of uh, blame on the Ukrainian war could help tip tens of millions of people over the edge into food insecurity, resulting in malnutrition, mass hunger, famine, and a crisis that could last for years and increase the chances of a global recession. Now that's an encouraging thought, isn't it? George Soros, who, <laughs> Many have different theories about George Soros. I first met him when he was running a hedge fund. Uh, now he's a billionaire and accused of controlling half the world. But he warned on May 24th that, quote, civilization may not survive Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. Now this, he told the World Economic Forum, which is a group that gathers every year in Davos, Switzerland, that civilization may not survive what is coming. Is there any wonder that we see that kind of anxiety in people? Let me talk about a book that was published back in 2016. Here you see the cover of the book. It's called Apocalyptic Anxiety. And it talks about various promulgations of the end of the world. Uh, I've listed the five here. I don't have time to go into all of them, maybe during the break if anybody wants more information on them. But the Mayan calendar predicted the world would end in 2012. Harold Camping, a radio evangelist, set at least two different dates. October 21st, 2011 was his last one, just a little time before he died. The True Way, which was a, a Taiwanese religious leader, set 1988 at the time when uh, God would come down uh, and appear on television in, in form of him and uh, proclaim the end of the world. Interestingly enough, very little said about 1910, Halley's Comet was predicted to come and destroy the earth. New York Times had a headline that year that said, Comet may kill all life on earth, says scientists. We talk about the demand for certain products that drove a, a higher than anticipated and able to build demand for gas masks and someone uh, very entrepreneurial started selling bottled air, which became a great hot commodity. If we go back far enough, uh, you can read about the Great Flood. A German mathematician back in 1499 predicted that on February 20th, 1524, uh, the whole, all the planets would be in alignment under Pisces and that there would be a flood that would fill the earth and ignoring what Noah experienced with the rainbow. One German 
nobleman actually built a three-story ark at that time. Even today, the Bulletin of uh, Atomic Scientists created Doomsday Clock. They've been doing that since 1947 when the nuclear warheads first were developed. And just recently, they set that Doomsday Clock at 100 seconds to midnight. So external based anxiety, it is very prominent. But that kind of anxiety can be limited. Rather, and I, I love this quote from Spurgeon. Uh, Spurgeon said, our anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strengths. And that's really what happens in anxiety and worry. Uh, we can have anxiety that's produced by today's social environment. We have anxiety produced by concern about our future here on the earth, as long as we're here. And third, I think we can have an anxiety produced by fear of spiritual failure. And that's where I want to focus the rest of my time today on these three different types. And especially as we near, as we get uh, near the end of this, we talk about this fear of spiritual failure, which I think is becoming more prominent today. But let's talk about first the anxiety that we can experience produced by today's social and political environment. The world really is a mess. And it's causing a lot of distress. You saw the results uh, on just the general population. It can cause it on us too. Think about it. There's a saturation in our life of events uh, in the news, hyped up, alarmist, confusing, exploiting, premature, and most of the time, as I mentioned earlier, ultimately and wildly inaccurate. Uh, there's one thing to remember in the news business. This is a mantra and just test this out in your own viewing of the news if you do. Uh, there's a news uh, mantra that says, if it bleeds, it leads. The worst story you can find becomes the first thing that gets led in the news, whether it's a newspaper, whether it's TV, whatever it is. So just beware that that's the job it's there. Today's media we have 24-7. It's everywhere. It's instantly global through social media. And remember, it's professionally produced. And no longer is it filtered. It's now raw. Say it first, correct it later. But when we think about how it floods our mind, it becomes what I would call a cognitive tsunami. Uh, it's just so overwhelming that we can just be uh, overwhelmed with it. What is the common element between all the people that you see here? Now, you may not recognize a lot of them, but you may recognize a few. Uh, like how Lindsay uh, wrote the late great planet Earth, or Paul Ehrlich, who predicted a population overburden on the Earth. Every one of these people got fame and or wealth from predicting major world changes that never happened. We have the key to understanding world changes in the scriptures. No one else has that. No one else can predict it. But the Lord predicts it and we know what the end result will be. I think this is the best advice of what we can read when we think about today. This is from volume two, the 1916 forward. I appreciate very much, as sick as he was, Pastor Russell uh, took time to write these forwards. And this one especially, I like uh, this section of it. He says, this volume makes no claim to infallibility, no claim of any direct inspiration from God in the interpretation of his word. On the contrary, it does claim that the divine revelation is the Bible. We are not able to see behind the veil. We are not able to know the things progressing under the direction of our glorious Lord and the members of his church already glorified. And here's the key. Our thought is that somehow the Lord is taking a hand in the affairs of the world as he did not do in times past. Now, no matter what segment of the Bible student movement you come from, what you believe about chronology, 
I don't think anyone would disagree with this statement. The Lord is taking a hand in the affairs of the world. And brethren, that's what we need to focus on, that the Lord is behind the activity and bringing to fruition the things that are promised before us. And that's the way we should look at that anxiety we have over world events that we see around us. Remember that somehow the Lord is working through these. Let's look at the second thing that can cause us anxiety. An over-concern about our own earthly future. We know with all the threats going on today and all the things, predictions being made, uh, it can scare us. Matthew 6, 27 asks a pertinent question. And I'm sure you know what that is. Who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And no matter how hard we try, we cannot deliver. Our, our own self-effort will never deliver us from the burdens of tomorrow. When we're preoccupied with how we're going to deal with all these different issues of life, given the things we see around us, it really does take the focus away from how God promises to deal with us and those concerns. It really is true that no one, no one ever sinks under today's burden. Uh, only tomorrow's burden uh, is added, and that's what gives more weight than you can bear. Remember the, the Broadway musical and movie, Annie? Remember the song, Tomorrow? Uh, that song, let it run through your mind. Tomorrow, the sun will shine tomorrow. Brethren, that's why Jesus said, by being worried, can you add a single hour to your life, or can you add another hour to the day? When Israel was in captive in Egypt, God made a promise before they were coming out. He told Moses, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will take you out from under the burdens of Egypt and I will rescue from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great retributions. I will take you to me as a people. I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who takes you out from under the burdens of Egypt. What were those burdens of Egypt? The biggest problem they had was just the everyday life that they had to deal with. And God made the promise, if you cling to me, if you come out under me, I will free you from those burdens of everyday worry. And he did. He went through the desert. And they got their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. He provided the manna, the doves, and the Lord kept that promise. He keeps the promise to us, too, that if we cast that anxiety on him as in our theme scripture, that he will take care of us. First Peter 5, 6, and 7 tells us that. Be humble, then, beneath the mighty hand of God, and he may exalt you in due time. And unload all your worries, that word is anxieties in the New American Standard, onto him because he is in charge of you. Brethren, the Lord is in charge of each of us if we let him be. Jesus went on to say in that Matthew 6, Why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, in all his glory, clothe himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow, is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Now, we don't want to hear that you of little faith, but we do want to hear that God is watching over every detail of our life to make sure that we will get through today. Here's an interesting chart, and I'm not picking on the sisters or the women, but it's one that was easily obtained. There's always a joke about women and their clothes or their shoes. Uh, the average woman says 21% of what's in her closet is unwearable. She says 12% is what she's never worn. 33% uh, in there say they have clothes that are too tight. 24% of the women surveyed said they have clothes that are too loose. 
closet problems? Well, 10% say they're depressed each time they open their closet doors. So I don't know if you can figure that one out, but, but one in four feel their closet is unorganized. Well, uh, there is a solution for that, right? And here nearly half, 44% says they can't find an item in their closet at least once a month. Think about that, that's an everyday occurrence. You start your day by going into your closet and the first thing you do is encounter stress. Jesus goes on to say, do not worry then saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? The Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. What we want and what we need are two different things. <laughs> well, this is Gretchen. I had Gretchen's permission, I think, to show this. Uh, when we moved from uh, permanently from Pennsylvania to Arizona, we had to clean out our house. We had sold it two days and we had to get rid of a lot of stuff. And uh, this pile is the pile of coats that we said, we don't need these coats anymore. Now, <laughs> there is a good example of having far more than you need, but over the years we had accumulated them and it's very difficult to part with things sometimes. But uh, I remember taking this picture saying, just stand next to that pile. These went to Goodwill and hopefully some people are to a prison ministry and someone hopefully is wearing them in good order. But it's just, as we examine our life, uh, having all these things, if I got one coat or two coats, uh, it's not much of a choice, but think when you have a hundred. Now that's perhaps a radical example, but it shows you this is the kind of thing that sometimes causes us undue stress. Now Jesus says to us at the end of this, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that the truth, brethren? Each day has things we have to conquer and solve. And it's not about planning, not just planning for the future, but it's about the anxiety that goes along with it. Let me tell you a story about a, a book that was written called Celebrate Joy. This is Belma Sewell Daniel. She lives in Winter Haven, Florida. There's, she wrote a book. Uh, this is when she was younger, and then you see she's still alive today. But she interviewed a man who had made a trip to Alaska, and he wanted to visit the people who lived above the Arctic Circle. Now you can see that on TV when people are saying, you know, a life below zero or something. But this is not a concocted one. These are the people that actually even lived there. But this is what he said. Never ask an Eskimo how old he is, the man said. If you do, he will say, I don't know and I don't care. And he doesn't. One of them told me that and I pressed him a bit further. When I asked him the second time, he said, almost, that's all. That still wasn't good enough for me. So I asked him, almost what? And he said, almost one day. So Mrs. Daniels asked him if he could figure out what did that Eskimo mean by that? He said, I did, but only after I talked to another man who had lived there for about 20 years. He was a newspaper man who had written a book about the Eskimos and their customs and beliefs. He said the Eskimos believe that when they go to sleep at night, they die, that they are dead to the world. Then when they wake up in the morning, they have been resurrected and are living a new life. Therefore, no Eskimo is more than one day old. So that is what the Eskimo meant when he said he was almost a day old. The day wasn't over yet. Life above the Arctic Circle is harsh and cruel and mere survival becomes a major accomplishment. He explained, but you never see an Eskimo who seems worried or anxious. They have learned to face one day at a time. My dad was, uh, was dying and he, in the last year of his life, he was in bed. His favorite song was One Day at a Time. Many of you may know that. Uh, we won't have time to do it here, but one day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking from you. Brethren, that's what we should be doing. One day at a time. Heavenly Father, help me through this day. 
and tomorrow I'll deal with another day. When we give our lives to the Lord, every day is the first day of the rest of our Christian life. And we need to put that worry and anxiety aside and just live one day at a time. For the young people, there is a lot of anxiety over money, over work. You have a career ahead of you. Uh, Proverbs 15, 16 says, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. We live today in a culture of success, uh, an excessive desire to acquire, to possess more than what you either need or what you deserve. And we, we see this all the time mentioned uh, today about it. But the whole idea is let's take away from them, give to someone else. That's not the idea because it doesn't matter. Material wealth doesn't produce happiness. It doesn't produce contentment. But there is this promulgating belief, at least among the Western culture, that life is measured by your bank account, the square footage of your home, costs of your clothes, the cars in your garage. Prosperity has come to be viewed as an end, not a means. Uh, wealth has been viewed now as a, as a river rather than a reservoir, which is what it always was. Remember Abraham. Abraham had great wealth, but it wasn't to feed a personal empire. Remember the rich young man that came to Jesus and he was rejected, not because of his wealth, but because of his attitude about it. And that was the problem. We are to be stewards of the goods that God gives to us. Proverbs 27, 23 says, know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. But Jesus tells us, to whom much is given, much will be required. Brethren, we are the stewards of many things that the Lord gives us, our time, our money, everything. And we must keep that in mind. Discipline. Discipline is important in all aspects of our life, and especially in our financial world. I remember Ray Luke always gave advice to people, and he said, live your spiritual life as though you'll be gone tomorrow, like the Eskimos, but live your financial life as though you'll be here for the next 50 years. Because it gives us a discipline and no one can maintain calm if you're worried and anxious about it. When you're anxious about it, you take undue risks in decisions about many things in life. It be, makes you impulsive in quick decisions that can lead to financial and social ruin always using the spirit of a sound mind. Jesus went on to say, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your treasure rests in the things you have, your bank account, your possessions, your heart is going to be cold and dark, just like that empty metal bank vault. I like this quote from volume five. I use it quite frequently and perhaps many of you have seen it. The man who has come into possession of the spirit of a sound mind has much advantage every way over the remainder of mankind. For the spirit of a sound mind is a spirit of wisdom. Such an one values more correctly than others the things of this life, wealth, fame, social position. He sees that fame is a very hollow, a very transitory thing. He sees that society is shallow, even to the most successful. Life means comparatively nothing in the end. Look at the Russian oligarchs that are going around the world trying to save everything they have. Let's move to the third element. Anxiety produced by a fear of spiritual failure. There's one of the things that has disturbed me is much talk about the fear as a new creature. We know that we must conform to Jesus. We must follow in his footsteps. But the emphasis on failure as a new creature has become perhaps a tendency to talk about that, not coming up to a high enough standard in or, and failing because of a sin or one other thing. It overemphasizes, I think, the sternness of God and the judgment and underestimates his mercy and his merciful assurance. 
And that's something we can't do. We have been accepted, brethren, as the sons of God through Jesus Christ. We must be aware that the fleshly defects we have and our inability to do anything, everything right, we can't do his will perfectly. And that fear of failure can cause us great discouragement and anxiety. And that perhaps is something that causes many to fall out of the way altogether. We must remember always we have, just like the Israelites were promised, we have this unique standing with the Father. He doesn't reject us just because of our imperfections or because of the mistakes we make. His mercy and his merciful assurance tells us that he will always be there. Paul gives us this assurance in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If we are walking after the spirit, brethren, the Lord is greatly merciful to us and our shortcomings. We can never come up to the standard of Jesus, but we can try as hard as we can to put on Jesus in our life. We have, as Paul says in Ephesians 1, 7, we have redemption through his blood. We have forgiveness of our trespasses. And that's the riches of his grace. God looks at you differently now through the blood of Jesus. He recognizes you differently, not by your flesh, but by your spirit. Go and look at Google self-help books. See how many you come up with. Millions. But no matter how hard you try, you will never entirely fix yourself for an eternal destiny. Only God can help us get to that level. So John tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We must articulate the shortcomings we know, to have them removed and to have the Lord help us. But to feel anxious about them should not be there. We should feel forgiven if we come to him in faith. Confession is an act of faith. That's what it is. It's not an ego buster. And that leads to the second part of this theme text, which says, uh, in everything, give thanks. In everything, commission. Psalm 103 says, bless all my being, the Lord, everything in me, his holy name. And I'm just going to skip through a few of those for time's sake. Who forgives all your wrongs, redeems you from the pit, crowns you with kindness, compassion, sates you with good while you live. You renew your youth like the eagle. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in kindness. It's not according to our offenses as he done to us, nor according to our crimes who quitted us. His kindness is great over those who fear or reverence him. And as the east is far from the west, he has distanced us from our transgressions. In the question book, page 272, Pastor Russell writes or answers a question. When we have a fear of death, we should seek the Father in prayer, should seek the assurance that we have the Father's approval. The Bible enables us to know when we are acceptable children of God, drive away our fears, we will find in our hearts more and more a loyalty and a willingness at any sacrifice to walk in the footsteps of Jesus unto the end. Why should I fear? What or whom should I fear? Nothing. My rod and my staff comfort me. And that Philippians 4 says, by prayer and pleading, with thanksgiving, we let our requests be known. Psalm 139 says, no matter where we go, soar to the heavens or to Sheol, God is there. If it's the dawn, he will, his hand will lead me. We are promised, brethren, a personal audience with our great God, Jehovah. Two parables, which I'm not going to go through the parables entirely, but two parables strike this to us. It's always been a little bit peculiar in my mind. Remember the parable of the friend at midnight and the unjust judge? 
with the woman when he went to the friend at midnight and asked for loaves of bread, the man said, go away, go away. He kept pleading to get them. And finally he gave them to him. And the woman that wanted to have uh, the judge make things right with her. And he kept telling her, go away. And finally he did uh, deal with it because of all her pleading. Jesus made statements about this. He said, because of the importunity, he will arise and give him the bread that he wanted. And so it shall be given you. Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Shall not God avenge his elect that cry unto him day and night? Those two parables can be kind of confusing if we don't understand what the point is. But both those, I think, contrast what we can expect of man versus what we expect should expect from God. Both show that God will not refuse requests as man does. All, it's the only two recorded parables we have where the reason for giving and the state. Jesus said he spoke a parable unto them to the end they ought not ought always to pray and not to faint. So the idea behind them is why would Jesus compare God to this refusing friend or some selfish dignitary? Everything that God is, neither of these two were. Yet both of them consented to the request. God's more than just a friend. He's more than just a judge. He's the highest dignitary in the universe. And so Jesus ended this by saying, shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Brethren, God doesn't sleep. He doesn't have to be aroused. You don't have to plead with him for vindicating your own. He knows who they are. That word importunity from the Latin importunus means knowing no shame. It means to be free from being bashful. Don't be bashful to come back to God because he's there. You can ask a second time, a third time, but don't think that you have to plead with him to get it. God will give you what is best. But here's the guidelines for asking that were presented. It must be right manners, things that are in harmony with the divine plan. It might be in the right way. We must go through God's appointed way, Jesus. We must have the right motive, James says, for doing that. And we must have the right stamina. Never give up until answered. That's the idea of the friend at midnight and the widow. But just remember, if you don't get everything you ask for, think about the things you get that you never asked for. So our theme text. Never worry about any matter, but make it all a prayer and a petition, giving God thanks and making your requests known to him. And we add verse 7. And the peace of God, surpassing all conception, will stand guard over your hearts and thoughts in Christ Jesus. We won't have to be part of that 76% of the people that worry about the end, uh, the future of the earth. Others will tremble. They will always but we should not, brother. God permits things to continue for a purpose. Our job today as ambassadors for Christ is to number one, exhibit a personal integrity when we deal with others. Be alert to the dignity of others and help them. Be objective in our own judgments and not jump to conclusions about what God is saying. Be independent in our discussion of world activities Let's be biblically based in what we know, what we do. And be concerned with the individual development of those in our care. We have been entrusted with so much, brethren, to whom much is given, much is expected. Let us focus on those individuals that are in our care. Make sure that we're doing all we can to help them and those that come across our paths. But let's be sympathetic to those that are wrestling with the major problems of the day. It's a difficult, we can be a calming influence to that anxiety that they have. Our citizenship is in heaven, in which also we eagerly wait for a savior, Lord Christ Jesus. C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. The principles of God's word today are very short supply, brethren. 
even amongst the churches, when we see the things that are going on amongst the ministry, the leadership there. And we are influenced by the condition of things in the world. Let us always strive to protect the new creature. We should be in sympathy with those that are in harmony with righteousness, not selfishness. And we reduce our anxiety through frequent prayer and focus on those promises and the things that we have discussed today. To God be the glory forever and ever. May the Lord continue to guide and direct each of us in our way.